Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, welcome to my channel. Today I'm just going to be doing a hopefully rather brief video talking about my pile of possibilities for the People April Readathon. One of them I've already begun reading and featured briefly on a previous to be read. And now this is um, hosted by um, Elizabeth at um, Bookins and Books and Roz at Scally Dandling about the books. And there are several prompts, but you guys don't have to like follow the prompts, just like reading at least one book about a person during the month will suffice. And these are um, Sappho. Someone will remember us, I say, even in another time, a fragment recorded by others, the famous um, fake quote by Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake, a known saying well before she supposedly said it in 1789. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., have patience, go where you must go and hope, actually from Lord of the Rings, which I have never read, although I have seen all of the films. Morgan Freeman, stupid is knowing the truth, seeing the truth, but still believing the lies. Freeman never said this, although it is a well-known phrase, and I do have a previous video based on a blog post about like the most um, infamously fake Dante quote, and that video also touched on several other like quotes that are like, you know, faked or taken out of context. And so anyway, I got most of these books out of the library just today. And like, they're really, really um, excited to read because I several of them are like related to presidential history and such. And this is called um, Eleanor in the Village. I just came across this when I was looking for a biography of President Theodore Roosevelt I had seen on display previously. And obviously, they, since they have the same last name, um, Eleanor was Theodore's um, niece. So they were like, you know, like clo close together. And this is by um, Jan Jarbo. Russell, and it's about um, Eleanor Roosevelt's search for freedom and identity in New York's Greenwich Village. I so, so wish, you know, I had been lived at a time when New York City was much, much different, like actual, like normal people could aff afford to live there and just so much exciting stuff going on there, you know, it's just like completely different city now. You have to be like a professional billionaire these days to live there. And so anyway, this is a synopsis. Hundreds of books have been written about Eleanor Roosevelt, yet is America's longest serving first lady and one of my sheroes, she remains a compelling and elusive figure. Perhaps the most mysterious period of her life began with her decision in 1920 to step away from her duties as the mother of five young children and move downtown to Greenwich Village in New York City, then the epicenter of all forms of transgressive freedom and subversive political activity in America. When Eleanor moved there, the village was a neighborhood of rogues and outcasts. A zone of bohemians, artists, anarchists, and misfits. In the village's narrow, meandering, tree-lined streets and tiny alleys, she discovered a miniature society where personal idiosyncrasy could flourish. Eleanor joined the cohort of what was then called the New Women in Greenwich Village. Unlike the flappers, the New Women had a much more serious agenda, organizing for social change and insisting on their own sexual freedom. In this fascinating, in-depth portrait of a woman and a place, Historian Jan Jarbo Russell pulls back the curtain on Eleanor's life to reveal the motivations and desires that drew her to the village, a world away from the Victorian propriety, debutante balls, and New York society gatherings in which she grew up, and how her time there transformed her sense of self and influenced her political outlook for the rest of her life. And this is a really like interesting, I guess, like genre or subgenre within biography. It's not a, like a whole life of a person. It's just like a particular like time period in their life or a particular aspect of their life. And many people like don't realize that's a real thing in biography. Like you don't have to read a book like documenting his or her life from like like birth to like death and legacy and stuff. You could just be like a very short period of time in that person's life. And so this was on display in a section about people who were born in April. They do this or at least the branch of the library I frequently most frequently go to they'll do like you know theme displays on different like you know shelves and cards throughout the year like you have people born in this month or like you know April or February was whatever like national blank 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 month or like oh there's going to be a super moon this month here are some books about the moon or astronomy or like doing like A to Z biographies like here's like A in this month and like going through the whole alphabet you know like over the course of a year or so just like really fun interesting things like that. And this is called um, Worst President Ever. And this is um, number 15, James Buchanan. It's by um, Robert Strauss. I wasn't sure about getting it out, but I just flipped through it. And I thought, you know, why not? I absolutely love presidential history. It's been a special interest of mine since I was eight years old, shortly before I turned nine years old in the 1988 um, presidential election when um, Bush um, Sr. was elected. And that was the time I memorized all the presidents back when there were only like 41 presidents. Now they're out, you know, 40 six and believe it or not I memorized them the old-fashioned way by you know, like writing a list and just like going over it and writing the list again and 
again, and just looking through books, like listing the presidents, like I, I was so gobsmacked when I was 25 and found out people these days think I'm memorizing a song it counts as knowing all the presidents. No, it doesn't. And you're not using your brain in the same way when someone asks, like, oh, who is number 13 or 25 or whatever? So you're not learning to associate numbers with names, or even if you don't know all the numbers and names, like together off the top of your head, you can at least know, like, oh, the 16 was Lincoln. And so I can count back or count forward like x x number of presidents and i'll get to that and it's just like oh i'm gonna sing a song and count on my fingers that's like so lazy but anyway rant over this is about um james um buchanan who was um president from pennsylvania he was the only um to date um bachelor president there have been like some presidents who like weren't married at the time they took the white house like their wife had since passed on or whatever they hadn't gotten married yet so like other ladies had to fill the role of first lady but you know he's uh, J james buchanan is like one of the most infamously like low-rated presidents he's like considered one of the like the group of doe faces of basically like nobody really remembers much about them as a group of like maybe like three or four or five or whatever before um president lincoln because like not really much well obviously like things of accord did happen during their um reigns but just like in the general scheme of history it just really not much except like helping to like ignore really like festering social crises and setting the stage for the civil war in um 1860 but i mean i know realize many people might not like know his name or know much about him but like suffice it to say he really was one of the worst presidents ever and this is coming from someone who absolutely loves presidential history so i do know what i'm talking about and this was also for the display of people born in April about um, Sir Charles Spencer Chaplin. I have read a number of other previous books about him, including a nice um, coffee table book of like photos from his films and personal life and stuff. Like obviously he's a very like complicated person, like an absolute like comedic genius. And I absolutely love his um, political um, life as well. I'm a very, very left wing. If you didn't already know, it's also in my um, very recently um, updated biography on my about page, so I obviously admire his politics very much, and I very much um, deeply personally relate to him, uh, you know, his, like, personal life. I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a broken record and not coming to the right word. This video is completely unscripted because, you know, he grew up so poor. Like, thank God I was never nearly as poor and struggling as he and his family were, but I just, like, really deeply relate to him and uh, the, like, the three um great silent clowns, um, Keaton, um, Chaplin, and Lloyd, like, I love and relate to them for, like, very, very different reasons, but, you know, Chaplin has it for, like, the deeply, like, personal, like, emotional connection. Like, I just can't get this yet with the others. I, like, love and connect with them in, like, completely different ways. And I also, obviously, like, his relationships with teen girls, it's kind of creeps me out, but he did, like, have, like, reasons for it. He wasn't, like, going after them. Like, he's, like, creepy nonce. He felt, you know, like, he was, guess, cheated out of a childhood had ended prematurely, so he was trying to recreate, like, that lost sense of innocence and he like eventually thankfully come, came to realize like I shouldn't be pursuing all these much younger women they're getting me into trouble and we're not on the, the same experience playing level and so like his I think fourth wife I should know this off the top of my head I'm um, Paulette Goddard she was like I think 21 or so when they got together that eventually did end in divorce too and he got burned again by like younger women and he finally like realized like oh maybe I shouldn't bother with them and so he was kind of reticent when um Una O'Neill, his, um, I think, believe it was his, um, fifth and final wife, like, started wanting to, like, go out with him and be more than friends, but it turned out to be, many people have described it, it his most brilliantly successful relationship, so, you know, sometimes it's worth the wait, and I'm 43 now and still haven't yet given up hope of having a husband, so that's, you know, one of the things that inspires me, you know, sometimes you just have to wait for the spouse who's, like, so perfect for you, even if you, like, failed in previous relationships or just, like, were, like, you know, lonely or, like, just not getting a spouse or a partner for a very long time. And so anyway, enough rambling. Here is the synopsis. He was the very first icon of the silver screen and remains one of the most recognizable of Hollywood faces, even a hundred years after his first film. But who was the man behind the mustache? What drew of the artist who not only directed the films, but held the camera and acted in front of it? Peter Aykroyd turns the spotlight on Chaplin's often controversial life, as well as on his classic films, from his humble theatrical beginnings in music halls to his winning an honorary Academy Award. Everything is here, the glamour of his golden age, the murky scandals of the 1940s, and his eventual exile in Switzerland. This masterly brief biography offers fresh revelations about one of the most familiar faces of the last century and brings the little tramp vividly to life. And I also ascribe very much um, Carl Jung's theory about race memories, and so I feel like, you know, even though 
he's no obviously he's like been deceased for a long time like we just like barely missed like our lifetimes overlapping he passed away about like two years before I was born so I feel like that little tramp is such an iconic universal character and now he you know lives in each one of us and he's he's become a beautiful race memory and it just so many of his films like choke me up at the end like even like the end of city lights if you want me to cry on command just tell me to think about that and that would totally do it and also the end of modern times particularly knowing that's the last time we'll ever see him again as the little tramp like walking off to the sunset but finally he is a partner to go through you know life's up, ups and downs and disappointments and struggles with and the speech at the end of the great dictator that like always pretty much always moves me to tears I know portions of it by heart in his um much shorter but like still very powerful speech on um, at the end of Monsieur Verdot Verdot I'm sorry I'm mispronouncing the name Monsieur Verdot I believe that's the correct pronunciation my French isn't so perfect that was in um, 1947 that was one of like several things that almost made me rethink my um support of the death penalty the other one major was um the the season finale of season one of the boondocks that was just so so absolutely powerful but anyway that's obviously a much more complicated subject for another topic i'm sorry if i'm rambling and this was the book i saw on display previously and i wanted to get out again um theodore rex my absolute favorite president is theodore roosevelt number 26 i love him so much even since i'm you know 12 years old i've really really wanted to name a future son after him although my First, um, my absolute number one favorite name for a boy is Samuel, and number two is Peter, so I would obviously have to get to three boys before I could use the name Theodore, but, you know, I have, obviously, I know this sounds totally, like, superstitious and ridiculous, but I, for years, I had a recurring dream about being pregnant with and giving birth to um, quadruplets, sometimes quintuplets, so I, particularly now that I'm 43 years old and older, women are more, like, likely to naturally conceive higher order multiples because our, our eggs are weaker and they like naturally split from eggs. So I'm kind of actually, you know, hoping that happens. And I personally would not do selective reduction on quintuplets or quadruplets. So maybe that really will happen. And I will have, you know, enough children to name a boy Theodore after all. And so anyway, oh, well, it's a really, really long synopsis. I guess I shouldn't read it because, you know, obviously you don't want to take up too much time. I Can you tell I absolutely love um Theodore Roosevelt? And oh, by the way, his real life nickname with his um friends and family was Teddy. It was not Teddy. That was a nickname given to him by the press. He wasn't so keen on it, but he got kind of like grudgingly accepted. Oh, they're just going to call me Teddy. What can I really do about it? But better just to like, like kind of grin and bear it. And this is a sequel to a previous um, biography, the same um, writer Edmund Morris wrote about President Roosevelt, basically his like, you know, rise to power in his youth. And I have read many previous biographies, biographies about President Roosevelt as well, like j biographies in general is like, you know, different aspects of his life, just like short periods of it, as well as some memoirs he wrote about himself. I absolutely love him so much. And on my um top 10 list of places I would love to go when I um go to New York City again, the Theodore Roosevelt birthplace in, um, in one of the Midtown neighborhoods, I believe it's in um, Chelsea. I previously showed this during my um, previous video about like my um, chatty middle grade March to be Red. So I really, really am liking this. I'm liking it um, so much. Oh, by the way, JFK is one of my favorite presidents as well. Maybe I would say like second favorite or so, but he's definitely in my top five and I'm liking it so much. If I, you know, don't finish it before I return it to the library, I'm even thinking of getting my own copy of it. And this is only um, volume one. There's like a, a volume two uh, as well about his life from um, 1956 on. This just covers his um, birth from 1917 to 1956 and also goes into lots of detail about his ancestors and his father who's like a total piece of work like oh just gross and slimy for a uh, racist bigot anti-semite just like so many reasons to dislike his father and this is also one I got out of the library recently about um Aretha Franklin respect by um David Ritz yeah pretty much like hopefully everyone knows who she was you know the queen of soul and absolute you know legend and, and inspiring empowering like role model for um women and this is a synopsis Aretha Franklin began life as the golden daughter of a progressive, brilliant, and also promiscuous Baptist preacher. Reared without her mother, she was a gospel prodigy who, by her middle teens, had already given birth to two sons and left them in her native Detroit for New York, where she struggled to find her true voice. She found fame, fortune, and that remarkable voice in 1967 with respect in a rapid-fire string of hits. Aretha turned the industry on its head by refueling pop with heavy soul. The queen of soul had survived and arrived. In respect, David Ritz uses exclusive interviews with her closest family, friends, and associates to write movingly of Aretha's path and the extraordinary highs and deep lows she encountered along the way. 
Just as she was reestablishing her divadom in the 1980s with hits like Freeway of Love, Personal Tragedy, the deaths of her father, sisters, and brother threw her into isolation. Whenever it seems the queen had, has relinquished her reign, she appears in scenes of ever greater drama and national significance. In 1998, when an ailing Luciano Pavarotti could not appear at the Grammy Awards, she came out of the shadows and stunned the world with a version of Nessum Dorma that was pure pop soul. From the moving elegies she performed at the funerals of Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks to her dramatic performance at President Obama's first inauguration, Aretha has become our nation's voice. Again and again, Aretha Franklin stubbornly finds a way to triumph over troubles, conquering them even as they continue to build. Her hold on her crown is tenacious, and in respect, David Ritz gives us the decisive and definitive study of one of the greatest talents in all of American culture. So that's my um, entire um, pile of possibilities. I hope you guys enjoyed this like rambling, totally unscripted video. Like I am still like working on getting like, you know, confidence behind the camera and my delivery and such like that. So please, um, please do leave a comment. I really want to make more friends on BookTube and AuthorTube and just, you know, have conversations with these guys. And if you haven't already, please consider subscribing and hitting the notifications bell. And thank you again very, very much for watching. I will see you soon. Bye.